I'm going to start by talking about what all the developments up to the point of Brexit, what, what they tell us, and then where we are now as well, what's going to happen going forward in relation to the Constitution. So uh, there's many, many things that could be said about, the, about uh, Brexit and the Constitution. I can't possibly say in all of them, I'm not going to. So I'm going to try and give some headline points. The first point is that Brexit, uh, when the referendum process that led, led to the policy being adopted and the events that followed leading up to us finally leaving the European Union at the end of January this year, uh, represented a real challenge to a lot of the existing principles of our constitution. In, in, and some of the most fundamental aspects of the constitution, including the, the, some of the principles of representative democracy that are regarded as being key to our constitution. And indeed, uh, and rather strangely, the, the principle of, uh, of, of parliamentary sovereignty, which I'm not necessarily a big fan of, but the people who wanted Brexit used to say they were very keen on parliamentary sovereignty until it got in their way and then they lost interest in it a bit. Now they're quite keen on it again, now they're in charge, but more that later. So it, it certainly challenged the way of doing things. It put forward a different view of democracy that, that a vote, a popular vote taken on a particular day on a rather open-ended question, which doesn't actually have any legal force, nonetheless should trump all other factors in the constitution. And this is before, uh, before Johnson came to power. If you look at May's first uh, uh, speech as, as Conservative Party lead, Conservative Party conference in October, 2016, so four years ago, pretty, pretty much coming out to the fourth anniversary of that, seems longer perhaps, but she's very clear in that speech that, uh, that as far as she's concerned, the issue's settled. I know that now sounds ridiculous. The issue's still not settled. It's not really settled for a long while, but she regards the issue as being settled and says that nothing should get in the way of implementing the will of the people, uh, the will of the people being to leave the European Union. You know, we, we all these things are open to question what what did the people really will very difficult to say but that's her, her argument nothing should get in the way parliament shouldn't get in the way the courts shouldn't get in the way the devolved uh, uh institutions shouldn't get in the way politicians shouldn't get in the way it's just the job of the government to implement that result and at that point she said we're not even going to provide a running commentary which she really seemed to think that she could just quietly secretly negotiate brexit and 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 come up with a deal and that was the end of the matter there'd be no requirement even for a vote in parliament at that point she wasn't agreeing to so when you look at, back at that speech it really, really is astonishing the extent to which she felt that that the executive had somehow been empowered by this popular vote to do things which you'd never normally reasonably expect an, an executive to be able to do without some kind of authorization and, and being subject to legality. So we really did see at that, that point a radically different interpretation of our whole constitutional system being advanced. Now, and I wrote a pamphlet for, for Federal, Federal Trust at the time about that called the, uh, the May Doctrine, because I, I argued that this was quite an interesting constitutional doctrine being advanced here. Now, over time, that was chipped away at, as we know. The Article 50 case, for instance, established first that the courts can look at these things and also it upheld the right and principle of Parliament to actually provide statutory authorization before Article 50 of the uh, Treaty on the European Con Union could be activated. So these, these points were established. The May Doctrine was shown to be in law and constitutionally wrong. Of course, the problem was that, that although the courts had the power to do that, and they gave Parliament a power or, 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 or confirmed that Parliament had a power, the political will wasn't actually there to use that power. So although constitutionally, actually, Parliament, if it wanted to, could have stopped Brexit at any time, even without needing to hold a, a second referendum. There's no actual legal requirement to hold another referendum because, as was established by the Supreme Court, the first referendum had no binding legal force. Now, politically, you may argue that a second referendum was necessary, but in theory, had Parliament wanted to, it could have stopped this at any time. And I think Parliament, what Parliament was quite good at was at uh, passing resolutions and laws saying that it should have the right to be consulted about things. But when it actually came to the crunch, the numbers were never really there to actually stop this thing from happening. 
even though actually the numbers were there in terms of what particularly, you know, members of both houses really, really, there were majorities against Brexit, but they were frightened of, of actually standing up. And there were, there were party political reasons, there were popular reasons. There was that wonderful newspaper we just saw the cover of and, and associated media outlets pressurising these people. So there was a lot of political pressure there and Parliament showed itself to not really have the will to use the power that it does have if it really wants to. And that, I suppose, comes back to my opening point that we were seeing this new constitutional doctrine being being asserted of uh, some kind of popular or populist majoritarianism trumping, uh, 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 an interesting word to use, but trumping all other constitutional principles. And we, we saw that being very clearly, and certainly it was being asserted by some of the people who are now in charge of this country. So that's point one. Point two is that this whole process served to elevate to power people who don't really respect some of the traditional constitutional tradition, uh, tr constitutional traditions of the United Kingdom. Now, some of those traditions are ones I'm not particularly enamored with. As I've said, I, I'm not convinced that having a sovereign parliament that can do it whatever it wants and is subject to no constitutional limitations is actually such a good idea, but that was being challenged. I'm not actually convinced that I may be getting onto controversial territory here, I may not. I'm not actually that convinced that having a monarchy or a constitutional monarchy is such a good idea. But you know, that is that is a traditional principle of our constitution. And and the kind of people who are elevated to power, uh, Johnson, Cummings, Gove and Co, by this whole episode, also don't really seem to have very much interest in a lot of those constitutional principles. We've seen how they were willing with the prorogation crisis to draw the monarchy directly into party political controversy. Now, for a constitutional monarchy of the kind we've got to function properly, the monarchy has got to be kept away from party political con con controversy. That's the only way it can really work. They were quite happy to do that. They were quite happy to put the Queen into a very difficult position, giving her advice that was clearly problematic, but presenting her effectively with a choice between uh, going ahead with something which was clearly gonna be very controversial and in fact was found illegal in the courts or saying no to a prime minister, which is probably even more difficult, even more politically controversial thing to do. So that's an example of, of, of people who aren't really, whatever school some of them may have gone to, aren't really willing to play by the traditional rules of the game, aren't really willing to respect those kind of unwritten rules that traditionally are the way in which our constitution functions. As I've said, as I've said elsewhere, I'm, I'm not convinced that those unwritten rules were ever such a good way of doing things. I've argued in favour of a written constitution for some time, not because I think it would be the answer to every, every problem you could possibly think of, but I think that some rules actually need to be more clearly defined and given a special status that you can't get under the, the kind of convention-based constitution we have. And we can now see an illustration of what can go wrong. If you get people, many of them coming from the party, which by tradition is supposed to believe in that way of doing things, who just aren't interested, don't feel bound, don't feel subject to any kind of self-restraint when it comes to those sorts of traditional rules. If they come into positions of power and they're willing to use the raw power that you can have if you've got a majority in the House of Commons in any way they see fit, you're going to get problems. And we've been getting them. We, you know, we're getting problems now. I suppose the latest instalment in, the, in these problems is this uh, willingness to use parliamentary sovereignty, which they now like again, now that now that they've got a majority in the House of Commons, to use parliamentary sovereignty to break with international law. If you buy the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, if you think it's a good thing, if you think it is really is as powerful as it said it is, then it is a natural, it naturally follows from that, that it can be used to break international law. But uh, I don't think that's a very satisfactory uh, state of affairs that we've got a constitution where you can do that, but that's where we are. So, and that's what it's being used for. So I think we've seen A, a challenging of, of previous established constitutional doctrines, B, an elevation to power of people who really want to challenge those doctrines, almost make a point of challenging them and aren't, aren't willing to buy, abide by, by those doctrines. And then I'm gonna get on to my third point. And I think this is a point that's gonna be about what we're walking into going forwards. So I think what, we, what we've learned, what we're learning is that European Union membership before that European Communities membership uh, was actually in many ways the thing that was holding our whole constitution and, and the United Kingdom as a state together. It, only we didn't really know it. Even those of us 
on the on the on the pro-European side of the debate, which in which I count myself, I don't think we could have been quite aware of how dependent the UK have become on being in the European Union to actually hold it together. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. I think that the clearest example is this. Uh, during the 19, uh, when we joined the European uh, Union in 1973, we didn't have any systems of devolution. We'd actually just suspended devolution in Northern Ireland the previous year, and there was no devolution in Scotland or Wales. The idea was there of doing it, but it hadn't yet been implemented. It wouldn't be implemented till the late 1990s. But implementing devolution was judged to be a necessary thing for the UK, partly for the actual co cohesion of the UK going forward. It was judged to be a way of heading off nationalist separatist movements, how effective it, it was or, or will be is another question. But the way in which we're able to introduce devolution, but also maintain coherence for the UK was actually, actually European law was the way of ch achieving that. And if you look at each of the devolution settlements, written into each of them is the fact that although their uh, legislatures can pass laws, those laws are subject to European law. They cannot legislate without European law. Now, that was known by constitutional experts as a principle, but I don't think what we really realised was what that really meant, that actually, uh, if you're going to have those kind of fundamental rules in the UK, uh, people in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, or many people, there's definitely a, a, a viewpoint in, in those territories, that they would rather be subject to European law in that way than they will be to be subject to laws passed by the UK Parliament. But now we've left the European Union, those devolved uh, assemblies, those devolved legislatures are still going to need to be subject to some kind of fundamental law. Because as, our U as the UK government has discovered, uh, you actually need a single market. Single markets subject to single sets of regulations are actually very necessary to, to having a viable economy. So although we've, we, we've left one single market, we need to retain a single market in the United Kingdom. And the only way we can do that is in the place of European law, having some single set of law. And the only way that can work in the UK is if it comes from the UK level, from, from Parliament essentially. But the trouble with that is that's highly divisive from a UK perspective because it looks like a power grab. It looks like actually from the point of view of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it looks like the powers that have come back from Brussels, if you want to use that terminology, are being hoarded at the centre. And that's incredibly divisive from the point of view of the UK. So as it turns out, having those powers in Brussels was actually a much better way of managing things from the point of view of the cohesion of the UK. So that's one example of why, uh, why actually the you're being in the European Union was holding the UK together and leaving the European Union is going to be very disruptive for it. Another obvious example is uh, to get sp territorially specific is the Northern Ireland, the Good, the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement in 1998. Clearly underpinning an underpinning assumption to that was that both Northern Ireland, i.e. the whole UK and the Republic of Ireland were going to be within the European Union for the foreseeable future. That's an underpinning. It doesn't say it expressly in the agreement, but the agreement doesn't make any sense except that everyone party to it is going to carry on being in the European Union. So again, you take that European Union membership away and it's very difficult to, 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 to uh, actually manage the, the peace process. And again, that's another reason why it could accelerate some kind of uh, collapse of the UK, some kind of breakup of the UK. And my third point to really, and final point, to come back to this written constitution argument, actually being in the European Union, and this is a point that, that, that uh, uh, my friend and colleague Werner Bogdan all makes, it's not just me who makes this point, but being in the European Union uh, actually provided the UK with a kind of a written constitution. The European law, uniquely in, in, in UK constitutional history, actually took precedence over normal acts of parliament and perform some of the functions we'd normally associate with a written constitution. And in my view, the fact that it was restricting parliamentary sovereignty was a good thing because actually parliamentary sovereignty isn't such a good idea because I think the idea of having a parliament which can change all the rules of the system and is subject to no real oversight 
is a bad idea. And we're going to see just what a bad idea it is over the coming years with the current people who've got a majority in the House of Commons. We're going to see what kind of things they attempt to do with it. So having that restriction is a good thing. Normally you get it from a written constitution, but we haven't got a written constitution. So the only place we could really get it from was European law. Now, again, that wasn't really an openly discussed fact, but I think we're going to find out that what we were getting from European law was some of the things ideally we get from a written constitution. We've got neither European law nor written constitution any longer. And I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't, there aren't, I don't think there's any experiment in history of a country going from having a written constitution to having no constitution or at least having an unwritten constitution. And I think that's already leading to problems as you know, some of the laws that the present government are trying to pass and it, it could lead to more in future. So I think we may end up realizing that the European Union was actually holding the country together. Whether we'll have uh, rejoined in time to stop the country from falling apart, if that's what we want, is another question.